And welcome back to Object Oriented Programming with Python. This is section 22. Let's look at even more shortcuts and more advanced Python stuff. Let's start with easy documentation. You may have noticed that we often see a multi-line comment which is always denoted with three quotation marks after most class and method definitions in the examples. This is because Python will actually create a attribute for each class and method that describes or that contains this description and you can create an easy, let's call it easy, documentation um, book for your code by simply using these comments. So. If you click the link there, you'll see more information. <coughs> and this example right here has a method and you can see the doc variable being used. Okay. Looping techniques. Again, here is a link for it. Now we talked about enumerate earlier, so I'm going to just bring it up again. Enumerate is a function that will take a list and it will create a counter that starts with zero so that you now have a counter for each element in the list. So if you look at the example on the bottom right hand corner there for i and v in enumerate tic-tac-toe print i and v you see you get zero for tick, one for tack, and two for toe. There are three other methods that are very, very useful for dictionary variables, keys, values, and items. Now, if you remember, a dictionary has elements, and each element of the dictionary has a name that goes with it. We call it the key. Bottom left-hand corner shows you an example of using the items method. But again, you have keys and values that help in the um, dictionaries. Even more looping techniques. Suppose that you have a list of items, but you want to look at it in a sorted method. You want to look at it in alphabetical order or whatever. That's what sorted does. Maybe you want to look at it from Z to A. That's what reversed does. Set gives you only the distinct members. So if you had apple, apple, oranges, oranges, you would only get apple, oranges. Zip loops through two lists at one time. So again, if you had a whole bunch of, uh, I'm sorry, you had a list which is a whole bunch of questions and a list which is the correct answers, and you used zip, you could go through the question and the answers in order. So if you look at the top right hand example there, you have the famous lines from In Search of the Holy Grail. What is your name? What is your quest? What is your favorite color? And then the appropriate answers for Sir Lancelot. The nice thing about both of these is that none of them change the list while looping through it. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They don't do that, that's true. And you should never do that because if you are going to change a list while you're looping through it, you will get indeterminate results because it doesn't know where it is, essentially. Okay, you can't change the list while you're doing it. These methods also apply that very same logic. Okay, even more looping techniques. Filter. Now this commonly uses a lambda function that we talked about. And filter will give you a new list with members that return true when you apply the function to it. So maybe you have a list of um, sales numbers for your entire department and maybe you only want people that sold less than a certain amount. Filter will give you a list of those people that only sold less than a certain amount. Map takes a function 
and at least one list as a parameter, and the function will be applied to each member of the list. Again, common to use a lambda function. So let's suppose that you have a whole bunch of employees and you're going to give everyone a 5% salary. So you have a lambda function, which is like, you know, salary plus 5%, and it will apply it to each and every member of your employees list. There's a link where you can see more uh, examples and you can read more about it. Match statement. Okay, sometimes you have a variable and let's say that the variable is the color of your fish. And if the color is red, you want to show a picture of a red fish. If the color is yellow, you want to show a picture of a yellow fish. If the color is blue, you want to show the picture of a blue fish. And so on and so on. And maybe there's 10, 15 of these uh, conditions. Well, you could do it with a whole bunch of if, else if, else if, else statements. And it could get really hairy. Or you can use this statement called match. Now, match has a bazillion options, and again, I urge you to look at the documentation, but the bottom line is it looks like what you see here, okay? Match point, because that's the name of our variable, and then we look at all the cases. Case, point is such and such. Case, point is such and such. Case, point is such and such, and so on and so forth, okay? If this was the color of my fish, it would be match, color, case, color equals red, case, color equals blue, case, color equals yellow, and so on and so forth. Now what happens if we have a polka dotted fish and we don't have any of those choices available? You have the built-in underline um, matching function and it will match anything else. So it's like a wild card. It's like in DOS where you put star dot star to match any file name. In the case statement, at most, only one code block is executed. This is different from C or C++ and several other languages. So here, in Python, again, if we were looking at the color of fish and case color equals yellow, it would do whatever you want it to do for the color equal yellow, and then it would just finish, and it would not execute anything else in the case statement. And that's very important to uh, keep that in mind. It only runs once. Static method. Well, what is a static method? A static method is used for general purpose methods that don't require or don't need to know about other class variables or constants. So there's a class that's built in, it's called math, and there's a function or a method called sine. Well, to take the sine of theta, you don't need to know anything else. You don't need to have any other math functions, anything like that. It works independently. So. Because of that, sign is a static method, and we can invoke a static method by simply saying math.sign. We don't have to create an instance of the math class. At first, this is a little confusing. Um, I urge you to read more on the, the concept here, but you have used it many, many times. You've used sine, cosine, max, min, you've used all kinds of functions without creating an instance of the class. In order to do that for your own, you create a static method and the way you tell Python that it's a static method is you use this thing called a decorator and there are other decorators, but this one is the static method decorator you will note that in the definition you don't use self because again it does not need a instance of the class. Similarly we have class methods. It's not a static method but it's similar. A class method can be invoked on the class. You don't need an instance although you could use an instance 
unlike a static method, it does refer to its own class and it can use class variables and constants. So for example, we had a class called physics stuff and we had a constant in there, gravity at sea level, that we used in several methods. So you cannot have that or any of those methods that require that constant be static because it needs to know of its class and it needs to know gravity at sea level which is defined in the class. So it can be a class method but it cannot be a static method. Notice that instead of self we use the keyword CLS in the definition of class. And again why are we going through all this? Well because you're becoming advanced programmers and because all of this stuff will be necessary for graphical user interfaces. Sometimes a method will take an indeterminate or a random number of arguments or parameters. So let's take for example our function max. Well you could have the max of two numbers or the max of three numbers or the max of 15 numbers or the max of 15,000 numbers. Well you can't define 15,000 different max functions and you it would be really a, a major pain in the butt to have to define max with 15,000 parameters because what if the next guy needs 15,001? So when you define this method you use the asterisk operator and again with that asterisk operator and I remember asterisk is sort of a catch-all operator for multiplying things okay so when we define a method that has an indeterminate number of arguments let's just for fun call them arguments we would say star arguments and that says to the compiler hey there is an undeterminate number of arguments so take this arguments word that I'm or arguments variable that I'm calling it and use it as many times as you need to encompass all of the parameters that the user is sending to me. So again, if this was the max function, it could be six arguments, as in our example here of max four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the definition would look like the example we see there on the bottom right hand corner. All of the arguments received by the method would be placed in a list that we named arguments. You could have named it integers, you could have named it anything you wanted, I just happened to name arguments. And every one of those parameters will be an element in that list, and then we just have to go through the list. Again, we don't need to know how long the list is, we don't need to know how many arguments we're going to receive, it doesn't matter, it's arbitrary. There's a link there so that you can <coughs> get more information. Similarly, we can also have arbitrary keyword arguments. Now this is a little bit more complicated to understand, but this happens a lot when we start doing inheritance and encapsulation. So let's suppose that a class is defined with a certain number of keyword parameters, okay? so. We have a class for rocket bodies, and we define it with diameter equals blah, 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 um, length equals blah, 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 color equals blah, blah, blah. But now we subclass it, and it wants to know what the weight of the body is, or maybe what the mass density is. That's a new keyword parameter. So how do we do that? Similarly as the single asterisk, now we use the double asterisk. And this one is saying, hey, I don't know all of the keywords that are going to come in, but I don't really care. They are all going to be placed in a dictionary this time, not just a simple list. Again, there's a link for more information and there's an example here for um, it comes out of the cheese shop skit from Monty Python if you are familiar with Monty Python 
Um, this will make more sense, but if you look in the example, you can get the whole, I'm sorry, at the link, you can get the whole example. Okay. Let's look a little bit about event-driven software. Many modern programs are event-driven. That means that they turn on and they start and they just sit there and wait for something to happen. For example, your television is basically sitting there 24-7 waiting for you to hit the power on command at your remote control. And then it's sitting there waiting for you to hit the volume up or volume down or whatever. It has, the television has no way of knowing when this will occur. We call this event driven. Events typically, not always, but typically will come from some hardware sensor and that hardware sensor will produce this thing called an interrupt. The interrupt then gets transformed into a software event. So in the example of the television, the interrupt is that the infrared receiver sees, oh my God, there's an infrared coming at me. I must interrupt the hardware and tell it that I am receiving these infrared codes. It then generates a software event that takes those codes and reads them and decodes them to make sure it is something that is a code for it. I mean, maybe you're pointing the remote control and it's from a different piece of machinery. Software will also produce events, but it'll produce it directly. Events are held in a queue, in a line, let's call it, and it's there's this thing called an event dispatcher. An event dispatcher is kind of similar to a police dispatcher. Okay, it gathers all these events, all these different 911 calls or whatever. It determines the priority level of each interrupt, and then it sends messages to the police cars in the mess in the order of priority, not in the order as they arrive. So an event dispatcher prioritizes the events and then sends them to the appropriate methods to be taken care of, very similar to a police dispatcher. An event, if it's of low priority, may have to wait in the queue for an indeterminate amount of time until a method can process it, especially if a higher priority event is received. Again, if this was a police dispatcher, they get two events. One is, oh, my kitty cat is stuck in the tree. Please come help me. And the other one is, oh, there's six guys shooting up um, the Walmart. Well, you would expect the police dispatcher to send the cops to the Walmart that's getting shot up by a bunch of lunatics. And the kitty cat can wait in the tree. Mouse and keyboard clicks, touchpads, mouse movements, screen swipes, all of those things are hardware interrupts that generate events. And again, we're going to talk about PID, Proportional Integral Derivative Controller, just a tiny bit. You can click on that link to get more information. And just remember, to type a controller that fine tunes the output of a device to reach a predetermined set point. The device output is usually in percentage points, and then you maintain your desired set point, like the temperature of your fish tank, using feedback. Or, in cruise control, it looks at the speedometer and then controls the accelerator. On and off controllers typically only have two, four, or eight levels of output. Both of these controllers are fundamental. Again, just look at your car and you'll see how often it's used. Okay, that's the end of 22. You should review all of this because, again, it's going to come in really, really handy in the future um, sections. And, you know, we've introduced a bunch of new commands and whatnot. So, have a great evening, and uh, I'll see you in part 23.